Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming this evening. And it's really an honor to welcome two very esteemed rabbis to our community. We had the honor and privilege of having Rabbi Meir Soloveitchik last year, so we welcome him back to Palm Beach Synagogue. And uh, for the very first time uh, in all of the 30 years of the history of Palm Beach Synagogue, we're honored to welcome Rabbi Simon Jacobson. I think people expect the story, so uh, <laughs> I don't want to disappoint. But they, uh, they tell a story about this atheist who was uh, traveling, he was going hiking in the forest, and suddenly he comes across a big beer. And the beer stands up on his hind legs and he looks like he's hungry. And this poor atheist starts panicking. And he says to God, God, you know, I don't want to be a hypocrite, I never believed in you. I denied your existence my whole life. It wouldn't be right for me to suddenly pray to you for help. But I'm not going to ask for me to become a believer. But if you could make the beer a believer. <laughs> so maybe have a little, he'll have a little rachmanas on me. And just when he finishes that uh, prayer to God, the beer stands erect, puts his two paws together, starts swaying and mumbling words in Hebrew. He said, I can't believe it. God answered my prayers. The beer became a believer, God-fearing, and suddenly he heard the last few words of his prayer. Hamotzi lechem in haaretz. <laughs> well, they say there are, there are no atheists in a foxhole, and while many people have grown in their faith since October 7th, turn to God, because you definitely can't turn to man in these dark days, so many have turned to God and come closer, but for many their faith has been shaken and questioned because we heard about the Holocaust, but most of us didn't experience it, but here we experienced the Holocaust or the worst day since the Holocaust. And so we thought it was most appropriate to invite two esteemed rabbis to discuss faith after October 7th. It's really an honor to welcome everyone here, but it's all in thanks to two very special individuals who have brought the most wonderful series to our community, the Critical Conversation Series. So once again, I want to thank Paul and Terry for everything you do. For the Jewish people worldwide, but we're fortunate to call you friends and members of our very own community. So without any further ado, I'd like to call upon Terry Castle to introduce the evening. So I'm just going to give you a short introduction to these wonderful two rabbis. First of all, thank you for coming again to the Critical Conversation series. We have, I think, about um, maybe two more after this. One is on Thursday, so it's twice this week. You'll get tired of us. And um, that's going to be an eating fest. Um, and the second one is Richie Torres, um, a pro-Israel. Um, liberal Democrat who will be uh, peppered with a lot of questions, I'm sure, from the shul participants. So let me just introduce the rabbis, and it's my great pleasure to introduce them because um, I was just lucky enough to sit at a dinner uh, having them have a dialogue, and I look forward to the continuation of that dialogue because it's going to be good, and it's faith-based, and it's all about how do we think about post-October 7th. That's the theme of it. Um, so, my dear friend, Rabbi Sali Soloveitchik, Mayor Soloveitchik, Sali to his friends, um, is an intellectual, a teacher, a public intellectual, a writer, and he also has basically three full-time jobs. One is as the congregational leader of the Spanish-Portuguese shul um, on the Upper West Side in the 70s, Central Park West. The other one is that he's a full-time professor and director at Yeshiva University. And the third is that he's attached at the hip to the Tikva organization um, that we're grateful to Roger Hertog for sort of not only founding and growing, but um, in, I guess, corralling 
Rabbi Soloveitchik, I imagine him in a basement being whipped to do every single thing I asked him to do. And I follow him religiously, so to speak. He has Bible 365, which is about 300 episodes, and it's in the can. He's not working on that right now. Jerusalem 365 podcast, fantastic, in the can. He now has a new series called Parsha and Politics, which I really recommend to you if you want to sort of have a spiritual insight into how he's thinking about the weekly Parsha as applied to current events. He's coming out with a weekly, in a week or two, he's coming out um, with a, a, a whole series on the Siddur. So you sort of go through the week with him and the weeks. And then finally, his favorite prime minister is Menachem Begin, and he's just starting a series on Menachem Begin. So incredibly prolific writer, op-ed contributor to the Wall Street Journal. He wrote the book last year that we opened up with, um, it was actually in galleys at the time, it hadn't even been published, um, Providence and Power. First-rate intellect, good friend, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Tonight, I've never met before, but I had the pleasure of meeting Rabbi Simon Jacobson. He's in conversation with Sally and our own rabbi, Rabbi Shiner. Rabbi Jacobson is also a profoundly well-read writer and scholar. He wrote the best-selling book, 400,000 Copies in 14 Languages, Toward a Meaningful Life. And he makes the Lubavitch, am I saying that right? Lubavitch Rebbe's perspectives evident to us on every aspect of love, life, death, youth, to old age, to marriage, to family, issues of career, health, pain, feels like something we should all read. And um, I know I just ordered it on Kindle. I hope it's not out of print. Um, he's also the publisher of the Algeminer, the online media publication, which I also read religiously. And he does recently exceptional coverage of the issues relating to um, the upsurge in anti-Semitism, particularly on the campuses. I recommend his work and I recommend reading Al Jemina. It's, it's worthy of your time. Um, so I turn the stage over to Rabbi Shiner, our own intellect and jokester. Um, and I just wanna thank the whole team at, at the Critical Conversations support team and Dini in particular for the support for the series. Thank you all for coming regularly. And we've had a great time becoming able to be part of this community and um, part of your lives. So thank you. Good evening, rabbis. It's a pleasure to be sitting here with uh, two such distinguished rabbis. So I think the best place to start our conversation is since the topic for tonight's uh, discussion is faith after October 7th, why don't we begin by defining what faith means from a Jewish perspective? Uh, as a rabbi, I've met many Jews who said, Rabbi, uh, I'm, I'm a thinker, I'm an intellectual, I work on logic and reason, faith just doesn't work for me. Can you be a faithful person and an intellectual thinker, rational, logical person, can they coexist? Uh, so if you could elaborate on what faith and the definition of faith is from Judaism's perspective. To me. Okay, good evening. Firstly, thank you for having me, and uh, I'm honored to be sharing the panel, my distinguished Rabbi Soloveitchik. Being uh, as one who deals with many people from all backgrounds, and primarily skeptics and cynics, so this question I hear all the time, of course, faith is for the weak, faith is a crutch, faith is escapism, nothing to do with reality, it all goes back down to the battle between science and religion, where science has replaced the need for faith. And uh, this is pretty much common Western thinking for most people. Um, so faith remains this enigmatic, at the same time you find quite intelligent people who, have, uh, who are deeply faithful. So let me 
without going into all the stereotypes, just cut through them. The Jewish definition of faith may surprise you. Faith is not the absence of reason. Faith is not for the desperate when all else fails. Faith is actually an even more powerful tool than the rational mind. And I would submit that most decisions that people make in life are not based on logic. They may not call it faith, they may call it emotions, intuition, instincts, love, whatever you want to call it, but it's definitely not pure. We're not computers. The biggest decisions in life are going to be based on something that's far less tangible. The Jewish people from the beginning of time recognized this truth from Abraham that the mind could only lead you that far. It's a machine. It's a great machine, a sophisticated machine, but could only lead you that far. It leads you to a door, and the only way through that door is with something that is super rational, super rational, not irrational, and not beneath the rational, beyond the rational. And that's a domain for those that are the most intelligent people are the ones that have the deepest faith, because the wiser you are, the broader the horizons you see. You see how much more there is to know. And I'll add just one more point, which I'm sure we'll talk about more, is that faith is actually, I would say, I was even thinking about a title of a new book, Weaponizing Faith. It's our single most powerful weapon, more than our minds and more than our wits. So we need our minds, but then we need something that has that super rational, unequivocal, unwavering conviction, which is what gave us the power to be here today, thousands of years, like no other nation. So before I speak to the very important question, I just want to emphasize how uh, joyful I am to be here. I want to express my profound gratitude to Terry and Paul for the blessing of their friendship. I want to say how delightful it is to see so many old friends here in Palm Beach and to specifically stress uh, how happy I was to see Roger and Susan Hertog and to spend time with them here this evening. In analyzing what faith is, especially after October 7th, we should take note of the fact uh, that in a profound way, at least in Israel, faith has increased rather than decreased following those terrible events. Uh, there was just a recent Jerusalem Post article which told us that, quote, an absolute majority of respondents, 75%, said that since October 7th, they feel a greater connection. Uh, they feel a greater connection to the state of Israel and the diverse Israeli society. And then it adds, Israelis have become closer to God and Judaism in the past four months. 33% of Israelis have reported a strength in faith in God since the October 7th massacre by Hamas. So we have these two things going hand in hand, a strengthening of faith and a strengthening of a connection to the Jewish people, which seems to indicate that there is a bond between the two. What does that mean and what does that tell us about faith? And why has faith increased rather than decreased in Israel following October 7th? So I'm just taking a, a, making an attempt at the answer, but I would attempt to answer it in the following way. Uh, there's a very dear friend of mine, uh, dear to some here in the audience, uh, Dan Sinor, uh, who wrote, of course, a very well-known book uh, called Startup Nation about Israel. And in the months preceding October 7th, he, along with his brother-in-law, Saul Singer, were working on a new book uh, called The Genius of Israel. Uh, the book was analyzing why uh, Israelis rank so high on the happiness quotient if they face such existential crises all the time. By the way, post-October 7th, they did another survey, happiness survey, and among young people, Israel ranked number two in happiness in the world. Number one, Lithuania. Uh, so as a Litvak, a Lithuanian Jew, I'm like the happiest person <laughs> in the world, which is what Litvaks are known for. Uh, <laughs> For sure, that's our thing, is the joy and happiness of life. Um, but uh, th the answer he proposes in the book is uh, that uh, Israelis deep down understand that they are part of something much larger than themselves, something remarkable, something really utterly unlike most stories on earth. The problem for my friend Dan is that as this book was about to be published, 
Israelis were, Israeli society was tearing itself to pieces. Uh, the publisher was saying, maybe we shouldn't publish this book. First, because it was slated to be published on the same date as Barbara Streisand's memoir was gonna be published. Uh, and Dan had to convince the publishers that this is a slightly different audience for this book. Uh, and then second, you saw Israelis at each, really, at each other's throats. But Dan said, no, we're making an argument in the book that deep down, deep down, really, Israelis do sense this. They still sense this, it's beneath the surface. And then right before the book was supposed to come out, on Yom Kippur, we saw scenes in the streets of Tel Aviv where Jews were fighting over just having a traditional Yom Kippur service, uh, providing it in the streets of Tel Aviv to just denizens of the city who wanted a traditional moment of faith. And then, of course, less than two weeks later, uh, everything changed. And a week after that, you'll recall, I think it was maybe October 13th, 14th, uh, there was a Shin Bet operation where one hostage was saved. You remember that. And there was a scene that unfolded on Israeli TV where the news broke during the news, during the broadcast, where it was announced that this hostage was saved. And the, anch the anchor was secular, Israeli, he was sitting next to a contributor who was wearing a kippah, and he turned live to the, uh, to the contributor and he said, can I borrow your kippah for a second? And live on screen, he takes the kippah, puts it on his head and says a blessing. Blessed are you, O Lord, Matir Asurim, who frees the captives. Uh, and on Twitter, uh, a tech guy commented and he wrote, one month ago, I could not imagine a scene like this. And my friend Dan immediately retweeted it and wrote, it was always beneath the surface. Pre-October 7th, we were all just distracted by other things. So what does this mean? Why has the faith increased? The answer, I think, is that, is that in a striking way, in a striking way, this terrible event reminded Israelis and Jews about Jewish history and about the fact that we have faced so many enemies in the past uh, and yet we are not only still here, we, we are thriving and we have impacted the world beyond imagining and beyond our numbers. In a counterintuitive way, it, it reminded the Jewish people that our story is anything but a normal story, which again leads people to ponder, why is that so? And how do we explain it? The best I can do, and I'll close with this, is a quote that I often cite, and this is from uh, an old article by the writer Yossi Klan Alevi about the most famous photograph in Israeli history, which is the three soldiers at the wall. And he talks about growing up with his father who was a Holocaust survivor, who still continued to go to synagogue but never spoke about faith, ever, ever, because of his experiences. And then he writes, toward the end of June 1967, my father and I flew to Israel. Standing at the wall, my father suddenly found his lack of faith inadequate. There is something about this little people that makes no sense, he said to me. Who can understand this history? And Halevi wrote the story at actually a very terrible time to, for Israel. This was uh, Olmert's war in Lebanon, which in a certain sense was the first, you could say the first war that Israel had really lost. Um, and so he wrote about uh, the depression that people were feeling in Israel at the time when he wrote it. Or as he puts it, the disappointments that have marked much of Israeli life in the past 25 years have culminated in this year of political shame and military defeat. And then he adds that often now, having made Aliyah inspired by that moment with his father at the wall, he sometimes forgets that he's anywhere special, living in Jerusalem. And then he writes, suddenly, quote, he says, I remember where I am. I feel myself then like one of those barefoot and wide-eyed Ethiopian immigrants silently stepping off the plane at Ben-Gurion Airport into Zion. I recall to my father's wonder at the wall whose fragile and improbable endurance he saw as a metaphor for the Jewish people. Like him, and this is the critical point, like him, I ask myself what it is about this strange little people that continually finds itself at the center of international attention repeatedly on the front lines against totalitarian forces of evil. Nazism, Soviet communism, now jihadism. 
all of which mark the Jews as their primary obstacle to achieving world domination. At those moments, he writes, I feel gratitude for having found my place in this story. In a strange and counterintuitive way, that is what has occurred because the Jewish people suddenly finds itself again against a totalitarian force of evil. But that has led them to ponder even more so the miraculous story of the Jewish people and to find which, what my friend Dan was always said, said was always beneath the surface, to find once again their place in this story, which of course leads them to the source of this story. And that I think is the beginning of faith. Thank you, Rabbi. <clears throat> Um, we have with us tonight uh, Leah Polin, the grandmother of, of uh, Hirsch po Goldberg Polin, who's been in captivity for 172 days. Um, where is she? Okay, if you don't mind standing up, we just want to acknowledge you. All of our hearts are joined in prayer with you that you should be reunited with your beloved grandson Amen. speedily. But the, the difficult question I think that many of us have on our mind is, you know, we say in our Shemona Esrei three times a day in the opening prayer, Melech Ozer Umoshio Magin. God is a king who helps, saves, and protects. We refer to God throughout our prayers as Avha Rachaman, a merciful, compassionate Father in heaven. Knowing the atrocities that occurred on October 7th, and we don't have to speak the horrible things that occurred, to innocent men, women, and children, little children burnt alive. It was a holocaust. How can we say those words with sincerity, that God is a king who helps, saves, and protects and that he's merciful and compassionate. Where was God on October 7th? And what role did God have in the events and the tragedies of October 7th? Rabbi Jacobson first. Without going into any elaborate philosophical, I think the most important thing to keep in mind and maybe this is the ultimate uh, secret of faith, is that we don't have answers to the most fundamental questions of life. And that's not a statement of surrender or weakness. It's actually the most honest and brutal truth. And that's why you'll find in all our literature, whether it's the Bible, the written Torah, the oral Torah, the Midrashim, the stories. And we know how much, we don't even know how much, but we know in every generation we've suffered. Nowhere has anyone ever tried to answer the question, why did this happen? Where is this good God that promised grace, blessings, gifts, the only answer you find is actually the exact opposite. When Aaron's two sons tragically died in the Holy of Holies, it says, Vayidem Aaron, Aaron fell silent. When the Roman emperor perpetrated his atrocities, the October 7th of that time, that we repeat every Yom Kippur, Eila Eskere, we say, these are the ones that are remembered, the 10 martyrs, the Asari Aruge Malchus. And in graphic detail, it describes how they were brutally murdered, which I will not repeat. So the angels and Moses himself come to God and say, Zu Torah v'zu this is Torah and this is its reward. And what does God answer? Of anyone has an answer, God has an answer. And they had access. God responds, Shtaik, be silent. Kach Allah that's what arose in my thought. 
again and again. Silence, silence, silence. So ostensibly, it would sound, okay, you don't have an answer, so you're quiet, you're silent. It's not correct. Is the most powerful answer possible. Like the old Belzer Rebbe, they say, when he was asked after the Holocaust, he said, if God, he was asked about these events, he said, if God wanted to come to me and explain to me why it happened, I wouldn't want to hear. What are we going to do? Exactly justify why one and a half million innocent children went up in smoke? The best of us, and what does it matter? Every innocent Jew, we're going to find an explanation. The explanation would be even more criminal and more painful and more obscene than the crime. Now, in this lies tremendous, tremendous truth. I remember I was, uh, a number of years ago, I was in South Africa on a lecture tour. For some reason, at that period in time, there were quite a few tragedies in the community there. Loyaleinu, God shall protect us all. Parents who had lost children. I mean, it was really horrible. And they asked me to give a private session, a private talk, just to those that had recently suffered. Honestly, I, it was so uncomfortable. I, what am I going to say? And I was, thank God, I've been blessed. How am I going to stand in front of a mother that lost a child? What am I going to say? I was like, but, you know, like they say, it's hard to speak, but it's maybe harder to be silent. So I shared, I shared some of what I've heard, some of what I just said now. And I remember saying that I am here to tell you that I don't have an answer. And I'm not looking for an answer. And the Jewish people's wisdom was they never asked why. They asked, what are we going to do about it? That was our power. When Job, the classic sufferer, stands before God, we have an entire book where he laments and complains and argues with God. Why? The classic question. Why are bad things happening to good people? How can a good God do these things? So there's one verse that to me always resonates where God says to him, paraphrasing, he says to Job, you ask me why these things happen. You ask me why there's death and why there's pain. Were you there when I created heaven and earth that you asked me this question? You ask me why there's death, but did you ask me why there's birth? You ask me why there's pain, but you ask me why there's joy? You ask me why there's loss, but you ask me why is there love? We don't ask that question because we assume, we take it for granted. It's all bound together because if there was no life and there was no beginning, there'd be no end. If there was no birth, there'd be no death. So the real question is, why did you put this whole thing in place in the first place? If we didn't have existence, we wouldn't have pain. Can someone here ready to venture to try to answer that question? And the non-answer is not ignorance. It's the greatest strength. I remember meeting a woman who was one of the first terrorist victims. You remember in uh, Shalayim, in Jerusalem, the Machna, in uh, Ben Yehuda, rather, the cafe, the bombing on Friday. I mean, that was a terrible time. So anyways, we an American woman who came to study in yeshiva in, in Jerusalem. She had come to a class of mine. And I remember I saw her sitting in the back. I didn't know who it was. Afterwards, she approached me from a distance. You know, she had this really beautiful, exquisite face. She came closer. I saw that the face was, I guess, what shall I say? It was reworked, lack of a better way of putting it. She came over. And she told me I was sitting at the Cafe Ramon. And not far away, there was the suitcase, that briefcase where the terrorists left and it exploded, I don't know, 13, 4, I don't remember how many, it was tragic. Many, many casualties. She says, I didn't die, but I died. I was waiting for a friend. I mean, to put it exactly the way she said it, my face was blown off. I lost my hearing, I lost some of my sight, I lost my smell. <clears throat> my parents didn't know I was in Israel because they never would let me go. 
because I was a secular girl. I wanted to go study. So I told them I'm going to the Middle East. Middle East, that's all right, you know. Um, and then they saw her on CNN covered in blood. And they, of course, came flying. She said, why would God do this to me? I came here to study his Torah in his promised land. And of all people, I'm there on that Friday. And I used to say to God every morning, take, take my life. Why are you leaving me here like a ragged doll? My dignity, my everything, my spirit. She actually said I was praying every day to die. And then one morning I woke up, the sun was shining in my face. And I don't know what it was, but some type of rush, some type of energy flowed through my veins. And I said to myself, I'm going to survive. I'll get through this. And I'll become stronger than ever. And I'll never, never forget the words she used. She said, Amuna, the Tachan, the words for faith and trust. She says, you don't know how strong they are until you have nothing but that. And that's what saved my life. Is this scientific? Can you uh, quantify this in a laboratory? How are you going to analyze this? Thank God our enemies, beginning with Pharaoh, never understood the power of faith. Because how do you fight faith? With what weapon exactly are you going to subdue it? So, my friends, we're all in this together. One loss is all our losses. We don't need to have answers to be able to forge ahead. And the acknowledgement that there's a mystery to life and death and a mystery to existence. Why are we all here right now in 2024? Why weren't you born 80 years ago in Europe? Can you answer that question? We have no idea. Why were you born into your family, into this place in the world? Why are we all here tonight? Most of the biggest questions are part of the mystery. And embracing the mystery is not trying to figure it out, not trying to philosophize it or quantify it. It's figuring out, as I said, not why, but what are we going to do about it? And yes, the Jewish people say to God the following. We have suffered greatly in your name. We have suffered greatly because you chose us. And we have tremendous anger even. And we even have complaints. But we are not going to give up on the goodness that we believe in no matter what happens. And even when you, God, sometimes are concealed and your face is concealed, we will continue to fight the good cause. Now what God is thinking when he sees that, I, uh, I don't envy him actually. You know, That is the Jewish people in a nutshell. So we don't have the answer to the why but we become better people and greater people, and that's the ultimate answer, like every Holocaust survivor will tell you. Our revenge, they pull out a photo album. Here's my revenge. My children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, the communities we've built, the families we've built, the country we've built, and everything that comes with that. Thank you, Rabbi Soloveitchik. So, it's very interesting. Um, as Terry kindly mentioned, I. I write columns for various publications. I write a uh, monthly Jewish commentary column for Commentary Magazine. And many times you publish something and you don't really hear a very strong response from what you wrote. Uh, even when you publish in the Wall Street Journal about a Jewish subject, usually the letters you get are, you get letters from Christians that say, Rabbi, thank you for that inspiring article. God bless you, God bless Israel, God bless the Jewish people then you usually get one or two letters from Jews which says, you made one mistake uh, <laughs> in this, and I think I want to just correct it. Um, but a column I wrote recently in commentary, I got an overwhelming response, which really, I, I, didn't, I, don't, I didn't expect it. Uh, and the story that I told in this article centered around two Israelis uh, that were taking part in, in the post-October 7th war. Uh, the first one is a man, an amazing man by the name of Golan Vach. Golan Vach is the head of Israel's National Rescue Unit, uh, which means that he descends in cases of disaster. All he sees is death. That's his job. He's, he's a, a, a very devout person, and all he sees is death. He came to Florida here after the Surfside uh, collapse. He was here. And he was, he was one of those sent in immediately. 
after October 7th, and all he dealt with was corpses. And in an interview, he, he said, let's just give you a picture of who he is. He says that after he had handled 250 bodies, he said a small prayer to God that something should change. And he said, suddenly out of nowhere, two terrorists opened fire from the right side of the road. We charged at them. One member of our group was wounded, but we killed both Hamas gunmen. And then he said, I thanked HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I thanked God, that I was granted the opportunity to revert back to being a soldier, not a body carrier, for a few minutes. So that's the type of person Golan Vach is, just to give you a sense of him. So Golan Vach told this story that he was serving in Gaza, middle of the night, with another uh, uh, religious Zionist, Israeli, by the name of Yossi Hershkovitz, uh, who's the principal of a religious school in Israel, the Pellet School. And uh, Hershkovitz was from a musical family, as are the, the Vachs. Um, and he heard Hershkovitz singing something, humming, in the dark while they're serving in Gaza. And so he said, what are you, what are you singing? He said, oh, it's a song I composed. She said, when did you compose it? He said, now. In other words, you know, in Gaza, obviously. Uh, what else are you going to do? Uh, and he composes a song. So Vach says, teach it to me. And so there in the dark, Hershkovitz sings to Vach the song that he had composed. The tune was new, but the words were very old. It was, Gam keelech begeit salmavet lo irarak ya taimadi. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So here you have two people who are in the valley of the shadow of death. And one of them spends his entire life serving in the valley of the shadow of death. And he is singing this song together with the composer of this song, Yossi Hershkovitz. Uh, several days later, Yossi Hershkovitz was killed, uh, fell, uh, serving in Gaza. And then, Vach, as he describes, experienced another loss after he lost Hershkovitz physically, which was that he said, I couldn't remember the tune that he had taught me. And then he said, it, at the funeral, it came back to me. And so he goes to Hershkowitz's family and teaches them that song. And they sing it, I think they sang it at the funeral, and they sang it at, at, at the Shiva. And then afterwards, Yossi Hershkowitz's family recorded recorded the song. It's as it were the last gift uh, from, from their father. Uh, that's the story I told. And letters poured into commentary. I heard from one of commentary's editors, Abe Greenwald, who said, uh, you know, we've got all these letters. Everybody wants to hear the song. Uh, can you send us a link to the song? Uh, so I found the links to all these different recordings, and they posted it on the commentary website. But for me, it was unexpected. The question is why? Um, and I think first and foremost, because the story is a metaphor for faith itself. Uh, the rabbis compare the Torah to a song. In fact, the, the source for the obligation to write a Sefer Torah, according to the rabbis, is from the verse, write for yourselves this song. It's understood to be the last commandment in the Torah. And in this rabbinic metaphor, the Torah, Judaism, faith, is not turgid text, it's sheet music. So the question is, what does this actually mean? And the point seems to be that in a musical composition, no single note makes a song. It's the different notes together that create meaning. And so to speak of Judaism as a song is to emphasize that we feel somehow that despite everything, our lives are, are part of something larger and covenantally linked to others. So my late friend, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, reflecting on this metaphor, put it this way. He wrote, faith is more like music than science. Science analyzes, music integrates. And as music connects note to note, so faith connects episode to episode, life to life, age to age, in a timeless melody that breaks into time. And then he added, faith is the ability to hear the music beneath the noise. Faith is the ability to hear the music beneath the noise. And so somehow this captured, for so many, unexpectedly for me, what it means to have faith in the face of horror. And especially when what is being sung, what is being preserved, is a new composition from ancient words, which remind us that thousands of years ago, David, King David, faced the very same questions. And rather than give a full answer, instead chose to sing 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Uh, the son, one of the videos we linked to, was the son of Yossi Hershkovitz who came to America, spoke in Riverdale. And he said, he said, now I feel, because he's lost his father, he said, now I feel as if I am in the valley of the shadow of death. Um, but I have the song, and then he sang, and of course the words take on when he's singing his father's composition, it takes on a whole different meaning. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Highlighting how he was connected across worlds in a spiritual connection that defied the horror. And that I think is, is what faith means in the face of this. Faith is the ability to hear the music beneath the noise. Not to answer all questions, but to feel the covenantal connection among, within our own time and throughout the generations. That, I think, is the Jewish response. Thank you, Rabbi. In, in a, may I add something to this? Huh? Briefly? How brief? Okay. Um, no, it just, it just um, reminded me of a very beautiful uh, episode. My, my father was a publisher and a journalist, was good friends with Elie Wiesel. And after my father passed away, I became, I continued the tradition. And I was once sitting with Mr. Wiesel, and I asked him this question. I said, is, is it true that when the Jews were being marched to the gas chambers, that they often would sing the song, Animamin, I believe with complete faith. Even though you may tarry, I believe with complete faith that Mashiach will come. And he said, well, we were in the barracks. They kept us from a distance from the chambers, even though we knew what was happening, but they tried to create as much confusion as possible. But in the barracks, all the time, that song, prayers, Kaddish, Shema, you name it. All throughout the day, you would hear humming tunes. So I said, with all respect, I want to ask a question. You know, I'm a, just an American spoiled kid. You know, I didn't endure or go through anything like this. But doesn't it seem somewhat absurd or even insane? I mean, the Jews are being marched to their deaths. It's the worst, darkest moment in Jewish history. God is completely concealed. They have all the reason to be angry at God. And instead, they're singing his praises. It seems like some deep dissonance and detachment here, escapism, what, what was going on? You know, and I say it with respect, I'm just trying to understand. And I remember his response, and I heard similar echoed by others, which I just thought would be good to add to this discussion. Um, he said, no, exact opposite is true. The Jews were declaring for then and forever, you may take our bodies, but you can't take our souls. You may take our lives, but you can't take our faith. And if it won't be us, it will be our children. And if it won't be our children, it will be our grandchildren. We will prevail. We will not go down silently as most people thought. And indeed, a few years after I heard that story, I was in Berlin and Hanukkah. And I asked the rabbi to take me to the Brandenburg Gate, where we know, you know, who stood there 80 years ago? Yemach Shemay Hitler, with his thousands, hundreds of thousands of Jugendrat, spewing his venom. We have videos, pictures. He stood right there by the Brandenburg Gate. You know what's there, Hanukkah now? Hanukkah Menorah. And to the right and to the left are the Christmas trees. And I asked the rabbi, how'd you pull that off? So he said, I know the curator, and I convinced him for the choreography it would really look nice to have a menorah in the center and two pine trees on the right and the left. And you see little Jewish children running around and these yeshivas in Berlin. And the Nazis and their children and grandchildren have changed their names and they're hiding their identities. No one's taking away from the tremendous wound and the tremendous loss. But the song of Ani Mamen, coming from those mouths, continued to sing and singing right now in Berlin. And I think every Jewish soldier and every one of us feels this in our gut and our heart through and through, whether we can articulate it or not is another question. But it's there. Why we need tragedy to bring out these type of things, maybe that's the next question the rabbi's going to ask, but I don't know. 
But the point is that Am Yisrael Chai, the thousands of years in an unbroken chain, defying all odds and all statisticians who've writ, written us off in every obituary, well, here we are. Look at yourself. Living witnesses, every one of us is a miracle. And the Jewish people will continue to be that miracle. And may we only celebrate it in good times and not necessarily need the darkness to remind us. I'm going to ask one more question of the rabbis and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. I've heard many people say since October 7th that October 7th happened, you know, searching for a reason, for some understanding, why did this event, why did this tragedy befall us? And many have said, well, Israel was on the verge of a civil war, unprecedented division and rift and hatred of Jew against Jew. And some have suggested that this tragedy befell us to bring us back together again. Now, we are not able to speak for God, obviously, and know God's intentions, but I'm wondering how that sentiment resonates with you. Do you subscribe to that? Does it, is it something that, that you ascribe meaning to the tragedy of why it may have occurred? Yeah. So uh, I have not attempted, nor will I plan to attempt to explain why it happened. What I, what I do think about is about the date on which it occurred and what we can do to find meaning in that. So just as, for example, my great uncle, Rav, Rav Soloveitchik, used to emphasize the fact of the date of the Yom Kippur War, uh, and how the very theme of Yom Kippur is the vulnerability of human beings, and how that attack came to a country six years after the Six Day War that felt strong and confident and almost invulnerable, and how Yom Kippur and its theme was made manifest on that day. For me personally, I've tried to find meaning in, and indeed consolation and inspiration on the date on which it occurred. So this is, as I wrote in the journal really right after October 7th, that uh, these many decades after the Yom Kippur War, we now have the Simchat Torah War. People haven't been calling it that, but that is what it is. It's not the October 7th war, it's the Simchat Torah war. That's when it broke out. And for us, Simchat Torah is a joyous day, not merely because we are finishing the Torah, but because we finish and we start it again, which embodies, of course, A, we believe the eternity of the Jewish people, that the Torah continues to be studied and there will always be Jews to study it, but it also embodies new beginnings in general and the ability of the Jewish people to overcome shattering events that happened. Uh, and I was reminded, as I was thinking about this, this took me some, some weeks later, I was reminded of this, but the, maybe the best Simchat Torah story uh, involves Eli Wiesel, uh, actually, and the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Uh, am I allowed to quote the Lubavitcher Rebbe too, rabbis? Or that's, uh, uh, we don't want to ruin my Litvak bona fide, so uh, don't tell anybody. Your but, great uh, uncle is already... Uh, yes broken through. Okay, well, we'll try not to spread that around, Rabbi, but yeah. Um, but uh, Elie Wiesel, in his memoir, has a story that when he came to, uh, to America, he met with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. This is when he was young. Uh, and he says that, first of all, he wanted to tell the Rebbe that he was affiliated with a different Hasidic court, not Lubavitch, but Vizhnitz. And he said, he told the Rebbe, I have no intention of switching allegiance and that the Rebbe told him, he said, the important thing is just to be a chassid. It doesn't matter which one, which I felt was a little hurtful personally, but okay. Um, and then he says, he says to the Rebbe, he said, he said, the Rebbe, he writes, had read some of my works in French and asked me to explain why I was angry at God. So then they spoke for a bit, and Wiesel asked the Rebbe how he could believe in God after Auschwitz. And the Rebbe responded, who else can one believe in after Auschwitz? And then this... Conversation goes on. Wiesel says, I'll accept your an I'll, I'll, I will take your answer, but I will not accept it. Then he says, on Simchas Torah, he comes back to 770, to the Rebbe's court. And he stands in the back. And this is what he writes. He writes, he says, suddenly the Rebbe saw me and beckoned me to approach. 
I pretended not to notice. The Rebbe motioned to me again. I didn't budge. Then he called me by name. When I still didn't move, powerful arms grabbed me and carried me over the heads of the crowd to the central table, depositing me like a package in front of the Rebbe. He writes, the Rebbe was smiling. Welcome, he said. It's nice of a chassid of Vizhnitz to come and greet us in Lubavitch. But is this how they celebrate Simchas Torah in Vizhnitz? So he says, Rebbe, we are not in Vizhnitz. We are in Lubavitch. So the Rebbe says, then do as we do in Lubavitch. In Lubavitch, we drink and we say l'chaim to life. So he says, envision it too. So the Rebbe says, okay. So he hands me, he writes, he hands me a glass filled to the brim with vodka. So Wiesel says, Rebbe, envision it's a chassid does not drink alone. So the Rebbe says, nor in Lubavitch. And then he writes, he emptied his glass in one gulp. I followed suit. And then the Rebbe says, is one enough envision it? <laughs> so he responds, envision it, I said bravely, one is but a drop in the sea. He says, and Lubavitch as well. He handed me a second glass and refilled his own. He said, L'chaim. I said, L'chaim. We emptied our glasses. After all, he writes, I had to uphold the honor of Vizhnitz. But as I was unaccustomed to drink, I felt my head begin to spin. My brain was on fire. And then the Rebbe says to Wiesel, in Lubavitch, we do not stop midway. We continue. And in Vizhnitz, he says, in Vizhnitz too, we go all the way. And this is the critical point. He writes, the Rebbe handed me a third glass and refilled his own. My hand trembled, his did not. You deserve a blessing, he said, his face beaming with happiness. Name it. I wasn't sure what to say, I was in a stupor. And then the Rebbe asked, would you like me to bless you so that you can begin again? So Wiesel writes, drunk as I was, I appreciated his wisdom. To begin again could mean many things. Begin again to drink, to pray, to believe, to live. And then he writes, it was Simchas Torah, which is also my birthday. Yes, Rebbe, I said, give me your blessing. And then he writes, he blessed me and downed his vodka. I swallowed mine and passed out. <laughs> I woke outside, stretched out on the grass where I had been carried again by the same arms above the heads of the crowd. Several paces away, a young chassid was offering a dozen or so men an eloquent explanation of the profound aspect, the mystical significance of my exchange with the Rebbe. So what are we to make of this story? I am neither a chassid of Vizhnitz or Lubavitch. Um, but I think you do not need to be a mystical master to understand it. And does one stop midway in L'chaim? Can one, after experiencing destruction, begin again, embrace the world anew, embrace life anew, embrace faith anew? That has always been the Jewish response. And that, of course, is what Simchas Torah is all about. Simchas Torah is about new beginnings and the capacity of the Jewish people to begin again. For me, it will always be the Simchas Torah war. And for me, of course, I will never forget the horror of what we knew was transpiring on that day. But for me, the very name of the war will itself prove a source of inspiration as well. I concur with uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik that we're not here to um, try to explain the events of October 7th, Simchus Torah, Shmini Atzeres, Simchus Torah. What did come to mind, you know, we all remember, we'll always remember exactly where we were that morning. I happened to be in California by my daughter, came to Shul, and the uh, news started trickling in from bad to worse to worse. You all know where we were. And, um, but we forced ourselves to dance and uh, the rabbi asked me to say a few words. So I said a few words as well. But the thing that struck me, and I'd like to share, I mean, I'll share through a, an anecdote. As, uh, the Knesset gets together and they're trying to solve the, the problem with their neighbors, the Arab Muslim world. And one Jew gets up and says, I have a new idea. This is all pre, this anecdote comes pre-October 7th, but it, it, it still fits. He says, instead of fighting with the Arabs, why don't we attack the United States of America? You know, all out war. And of course they'll beat us. And uh, then, out of their guilt, instead of getting $20 billion a year, 
we'll get $100 billion a year, like Japan and Germany, and they'll help rebuild us. It's a great idea, right? Only a Jew can come up with something. <laughs> um, anyway, an old Jew sitting in the back of the Knesset um, in a thick accent gets up and says, yeah, very nice idea, but what happens if we win? In other words, we Jews have mastered the art of defense. Nobody can play defense like we do. We've defended ourselves and protected ourselves and survived everything and everyone. And every but offense is a very different story. Um, I think this is one of the both tragic but also tremendous opportunities we have now. And that's what came to mind that, that morning. And that is... I hear this all the time from especially young people. You know, I'm sick and tired of hearing, what is a Jew? A Jew? A Jew is an anti-anti-Semite. You know? A Jew is the clear, stop killing us. Is that what we stand for? You know, there was a time where the Jewish homeland united everyone because we had a Holocaust. We had Europe. We had we were persecuted. And everyone was united at at least most people were united that we need a homeland fine. But that's when you're fighting enemies. Once you have a homeland, what is the vision for the future? What is the Jewish vision? I challenge myself and I challenge all of us here. What is our vision? Is it just to eliminate Hamas and all our enemies? And no more attacks? And then we'll feel that that's victory? We all understand the necessity for that. I'm not, I'm not minimizing that. We can't be attacked like this, God forbid, and so on. But what do we stand for? Are we able to declare what's the vision for the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? If you're asked the question, what does it mean to be Jewish? Why is it important that the Jewish people be on this earth? I think uh, viscerally, we all understand. But how would you explain that if your son and daughter asked you that question? And not skeptically, just an innocent question. Why is Israel that important? Why do we need to have a state, a land of Israel? Why is it so central? Why do we pray toward the east? Wherever we are in the world, we're praying toward the east. Yerushalayim is in our lips. I forget Jerusalem. Everywhere, under a chuppah, and tragically during Shiva. We're always mentioning Yerushalayim, Israel. Why is it so central? If we can't answer that question, by omission, what is that saying? So I think, again, in our guts, we all feel the importance of it. To me, this is what I was thinking about when that was happening. And not, God forbid, justifying why it happened. No, no, we don't justify treasure. Could, God could always find some other way. doesn't have to use this type of uh, method. But after the fact, Maimonides writes that tremendous line at the beginning of the laws of fasting, why we fast at a fast day. He says, because when a catastrophe strikes a people or an individual, it would be cruel and insensitive to say it was random, mikra nikris, it just happened. It means it's a wake-up call, time for introspection and soul searching. Not more painting, pointing fingers, definitely not at others, and not even at yourself, but just not to just take it for granted. What does it tell us? Yes, maybe this is a tremendous, unprecedented wake-up call of the soul of the Jewish people, the soul of Israel, the soul of Torah. Why it has to come in this way, I, again, I'm not going to explain that. But after the fact, I don't know if there'll be a more definitive event in our lives, to be honest. I'm convinced there won't be. and We sure hope there won't be. But as t time passes, and generations will look back at 2023, 2024, Simchus Torah War. What will they see? Yeah, we fought valiantly and we destroyed our enemy. But we want to leave something stronger. We want to say we took the situation and we transformed it into the unprecedented wake-up call to show the world once and for all, you know why we're here, the Jewish people? Because we have a grandfather, a great-grandfather called Abraham. And he single-handedly with his wife, Sarah, just one individual, Echad Hayavram, pioneered 
everything we cherish today, all the freedoms, everything people talk about, the civil, civil rights, human rights, virtue, charity. I mean, people are not even aware. You know, the United States is only 250 years old. That's like, we're here almost 4,000 years championing, championing, these, uh, championing, championing these ideas and values. It's only recently become institutionalized that the secular world and the non-Jewish world is starting to embrace Abrahamic principles. We've been doing this for thousands of years and hated for it and persecuted for it. I've never been more proud to be Jewish than I am today. Because one know what a Jew is? That's what a Jew is. We represent the ultimate of morality. Everything that every human being on earth cherishes, not just Jews. There's a powerful medrash that says that if the non-Jewish world knew the blessings they receive from Israel, from the Holy Temple, from the Jewish people, those that bless you shall be blessed. If they knew what blessings they receive from us, instead of attacking Israel, they surround it with legions protecting Israel against its enemies. So this is our opportunity now to shine and rise. And that what's happened at Sinai over 3,300 years ago, and what happened in the times of Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob and Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Leah, in an unbroken chain, that we can say, yes, we are their grandchildren and we're living up to their legacy. We have a responsibility today to become proactive Jews, not reactive, not defense, offense, proactive. Every one of us here have our sphere of influence, it starts with our own children, it starts at home, all politics is local. Everything begins right here at your threshold, your doorstep. So I see this evening we're here together. To me, this is like the celebration and Jews everywhere. There is no one is compl complacent today. You know, apathy is, uh, you know, the guy that asked his friend, what's worse, apathy or ignorance? And he said, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> that is now not our problem. But now we have to harness this, and teach ourselves and our children what it means to be a Jew what is Israel? Why is it central and important, not just to the Jewish people, to the entire world? So that's how I see the events of October 7th, of Simchus Torah, waking us up to that reality, to that conscience, to that uh, higher consciousness. Thank you, Rabbi. We'll take some questions from the audience, if anyone would like to pose a question. Th thank you for all of your words in giving us faith tonight. But I have a question. I believe Israel is a sovereign nation. And I have a question. How old is the Jewish nation? Because if I ask three different people, I get three different answers. So if we're going to talk about Israel, having ownership of its lands and celebrating its birthday from its inception, can you help identify what is that date? A year ago, Thanksgiving weekend, I went to Egypt. The guy takes you to the uh, museum in Cairo, shows you the different uh, remnants of pharaohs. And I asked him to surprise, I said, this is all very good, but there's something here in the museum I want to see. And this was clearly not part of his regular tour. And uh, it was a stone pillar that was, you know, stuck away in a corner. And you can look it up, it's called the Stell of Bernepta. Uh, Merneptah was the son of Ramesses the Great, Ramesses the uh, Second, the son of Ewell Brenner, in other words. Uh, uh, and, um, and the reason I wanted to see this, and he was surprised and interested, and he's usually not, from, you know, this is not the part of the usual ask, but I had come just for that. That's really all I was interested in seeing in this museum because the stel has uh, the first mention of Israel outside the Bible. And we're talking from the 13th century BCE. And it's describing 
various events in the Middle East, uh, various city-states that have been destroyed, Ashkelon or whatever is laid waste and so forth, and then denoting, seemingly denoting a people that have not yet been fully established in the Holy Land, but seem to be arriving around that time and settling around that time. The Stel tells us Israel is laid waste, its seed is not. That's the first mention of Israel outside the Bible, as I think Rabbi Sachs put it. First mention of Israel outside the Bible is an obituary for Israel. And my wife has a picture there of me standing with my fist uh, raised high. Basically what I do is sort of, my form of tourism is going to various museums that describe the destruction of the Jewish people. Uh, and marking the fact that these empires are gone. Um, so you have a picture of me there, and uh, as well as a great picture taken by my wife of me davening in Talos and Tefillin in front of the pyramids of Giza. Uh, so that's the first mention we have in history of the Jewish people in the region of the land of Israel. Which means, of course, that in a very real way, to use contemporary terminology, the Jewish people are what you might call the indigenous people of the land of Israel. Uh, and the modern state of Israel, uh, born in May of 1948, was, of course, a new state being born. That's why we mark it and we celebrate it. Uh, and it was the great miraculous event of the 20th century. Uh, but what it marked was, simultaneously, the restoration of the Holy Land's indigenous people to its sovereign rights to that land. And that, of course, is the story that we should tell. Just as Menachem Begin, my hero, as Terry mentioned, uh, who uh, incentivized the British to leave, uh, uh, led, you might say, one of the great anti-colonialist movements on behalf of the indigenous people of the Holy Land. Uh, one of the most striking stories I saw from the Gaza War was Jews that came to a synagogue in Gaza. Not a synagogue in Gaza from post-1967. Synagogue in Gaza from centuries ago and prayed there for the first time in who knows how long. Prayed as their ancestors, the indigenous people of the Holy Land, which of course includes Gaza, um, ever prayed. Um, so how old is this, the modern state of Israel? We know that. But how old is the, uh, are the Jewish people this is not, not, not to minimize, but it's not only a matter of faith. I can open the Torah and show it to you. But you can also go to one dusty corner in a museum in Cairo and learn about the indigenous people of the Holy Land. We'll take one more last question for the evening. This is a question that I think many of us here are asked at different times. And I, I, I take it, I ask it in good faith. And, and my, my mother raised her three boys um, to revere Hasidus. And we have great respect, and, and we do. Yet, you have talked about how proud you are and how we should be offensive and not defensive. But I'm constantly asked. How do you integrate the concept of the, um, the, has, the fall right Hasidists who don't want to be offensive and don't want to protect Israel? How do you integrate into it your beliefs and your explanation of how that fits into Israel? Uh, I guess that's directed to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and just for the record, anyone that denies their connection to Hasidim so many times in one evening, um, you know there's something going on. 
but we need you where you are, so. Um, As a Sephardic rabbi, you mean. <laughs> right, that's right. Sephardic Litvak. Um, the happiest you could possibly be. Sephardic Litvak is the most happy demographic. Okay. Um, I count you as a, uh, maybe you said Vizhnitz, Chabad. To me, we all stood at Sinai. We're all brothers and sisters, and we're all one. Here, here, um, here, here. Yeah. And I say that to you as well. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what assumptions you're basing your question on, because sometimes assumptions can be wrong. So I think I should first uh, clarify a few points. Echoing, or maybe continuing where Rabbi Soloveitchik left off, we are not just the Zionists from 1948. We're here from, uh, well, we're talking 4,000 years. I don't know if you dated it exactly. Zion and Zionism is in our blood. It's very much part of every Jew. Chassid or not Chassid, Chabad or not Chabad, Svardi, Ashkenazi, I mean, this is uh, central. The triad, the Jewish people, the land of Israel, and the Torah of Israel. This was from day one, when Jacob woke up on the mountain and realized, he says, this is the gate to heaven. Israel is the gate to heaven for all of us. All our prayers are directed there. So let's just begin by making that statement. I don't think there's a chassid or non-chassid. Anyone that follows Torah that can deny that fact, it's documented, it's obligated. I mean, it's part of everything. The idea of uh, kibbutz Goliath, that we shall all return to the Holy Land, to the Promised Land, all of us. So that's, the, to me, the premise of it all. So there's no the concept of not supporting and not defending and not fighting for Eretz Yisrael, and everything it represents is just, to me, just not even, uh, not, even in, not even a consideration. It's not even an opinion. There's no such an opinion. So I'd need to hear more what you're referring to when you say someone that... I think he's reject- referring to the, the Haredim who don't serve in the Israeli army. Okay, fine. So let me address that. So let me make it clear. I'm not one of them, and I don't need to defend them, and I don't represent them. So you have to pose that question to anyone that's in that place and let them explain themselves based on Torah. I don't think I should sit here now and try to find a, make a case for them. Uh, they can just be flat wrong. It would be like somebody saying, hey, you know what, I don't pay taxes or I, I cheat people in business and I'm a religious Jew. I'd say, really? Which religion did you get that from? It says in the Torah, lay signa, if you shouldn't steal. So. We don't have to start defending people who are doing things that are antithetical to Judaism. Are there different opinions about Zionism, about modern Zionism? Of course, there were those that opposed the modern Zionist movement. There were those that, that followed it. And you know, in Zionism itself, I don't know if you know this, there's around, I think, 10 variations. I once did a whole research on it. There was the agricultural Zionists, the socialist Zionists, the spiritual Zionists. You can imagine, for every Zionist in the room, there was another version. Um, so the fact that we have different opinions, that's not the issue. The opinions have to, however, however all be within the framework of Torah. I'll just share, since um, um, just not to be outmatched, since you told the story of the Babacher Rebbe, maybe I should tell one too. <laughs> um, um, oh, it's an interesting one. President Shazar, right? We all know Shneir Zalman Rubarov was, a, uh, was the president of Israel, and he considered himself a chassid. He's named after the Balatanya, Shneir Zalman. And he was known to be very close with Lubavitch Rebbe. He came to see him many times, including as president, at the chagrin of quite a few people, because they say a president shouldn't visit a Rebbe, a Rebbe should visit a president. But anyway, he still came. He received a letter from the Rebbe once that was addressed, President Shazar, President of Eretz Yisrael. So he writes back to the Rebbe a letter. This we have now. It's published. I, I think you'll love. I, I think it's it's amazing. Um, 
he says to the Rebbe, why are you causing me to have to choose between being a chaser or being a president of Israel? You title me as president of Eretz Israel. I took a vow to be president of Medina Israel, state of Israel, not the land of Israel. And now you're making me either to be a chassid listening to what you have to say, or I have to, or my vow to the to the land to the state of Israel. That's what he writes to the Rebbe in Hebrew. And the Rebbe responds to him, one, you were born before I was. So how could I take away your ability of being a chassid? You're a chassid before I was a chassid. So how could I? Number two, I actually um, expanded your position. Instead of being a president of a country that began in 1948, you're now a president that began in uh, the year 1948, according to the Hebrew calendar, pre matan Torah, the time of Abraham. So you're a president that's of a country that's here thousands of years. I found that to be not, you know, you could say it's cute, but it wasn't cute. It was actually stating a tremendous truth that no one's taking away from any of the events that happened in 1948. There are many blessings and the gifts and the miracles and so on. But let's not forget, and exactly I'm just reiterating what the rabbi said, Rabbi Soloveitchik said, we are here thousands of years. We don't want to hear that the UN gave it to us in 1948, and now, you know what, maybe they'll reconsider, and we have to consider that? No. They just ratified exactly what, what, what the, we, we, of the country that we belong to and, and, and belongs to us in every, every possible way. And I'll conclude with the words of um, Rashi. Everybody knows Rashi, the first verse in the Torah. Why does the Torah begin with God created heaven and earth? Should it began with the mitzvahs, the mitzvah of Kiddush Lavach, Chaydesh Azalachem. And Rashi says something prophetic. He says, because if the nations of the world will ever come and say, Listimatem, that you, the Jews, are thieves, you've stolen our land, the non Jews will say that. So the Torah begins and preempts that. And God says, You tell them, I created heaven and earth, and I give the or different parts of the earth to those that I want to give it to. I gave most of the earth to the Gentiles, to the nations of the world, and I gave one part of the world to you, the Jewish people. This is Rashi a thousand years ago, before there was a UN. So we've been around, we've heard it all. I'm Yisrael Chai, we shall prevail. <laughs> Thank you very much, rabbis.